today is from Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. This is on page 82 in your New Testament. Then Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. The word of the Lord. I'm going to step down and get some water. Some of the medication I take, and you may be familiar with this, dehydrate. And so I always have to keep some water nearby. If that's why you see me scrambling for that water, that's fine. Uh, and uh, I apologize, but uh, it really helps. It helps. Especially in preaching, sharing the word. So I'm beginning today a sermon series, and on the Yellow Wind sermon, I share a little bit about it. It's called Stops Along the Way, and we're going to look at five stops that Jesus made. Well, actually, we're going to start in Galilee. We wouldn't really call that a stop, but a start. And then we're going to look as Jesus moves with his apostles toward the cross. We're going to look at the stops that he makes along the way, because each one is significant. And there is a message about what he's going to do in every stop that he makes. So I hope you'll join me, either here in the sanctuary or online, as we share this sermon series together. Today, we begin, as you just heard what was read, we begin in Galilee. And I have a question to start this sermon series. Have you ever started a journey in which you have little more than a destination and no idea about what you would experience at that journey's end? If we think about it, our society, our nation's on that kind of journey right now. As we begin to deal with this novel coronavirus, coronavirus, and it doesn't mean don't drink corona beer, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> coronavirus. Well, I'm not, I'm not telling you to drink it either. So I didn't drink it. A journey much of the world really has already begun to make because they had to. Such journeys do not actually become real to us until we are required to take action for ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities. And so it is, and so it will be with this disease. We don't want our lives to be inconvenienced or interrupted, especially by threats. And that is why our initial reaction to such news usually is one of apathy or maybe even denial. That's going to happen to someone else, not us. Or it cannot possibly be as bad as some are making it out to be. For me, that's a prayer. That's a prayer. Then we realize we are going to have to respond because others around us are already doing so. That is why some of the stores are beginning to experience shortages of some ordinary items, such as hand wipes and disinfectants, while surgical masks are becoming either impossible to find, or if you do have enough money to find them, they are ridiculously expensive. China produces most of the world's disposable masks about 20 million a day. But right now, the demand in China alone is anywhere from 50 to 60 million a day. Although these masks, as you may know, have a very low probability of preventing an airborne virus. 
But the demand is a sign of uncertainty. Uncertainty. And uncertainty, if it remains and keeps going, can create panic. And as soon as panic sets in, we have to respond to it, no matter how much we would prefer to ignore it. It kind of makes me wonder if panic is how the apostles felt when Jesus so vividly described for them the journey that they were about to start from Galilee. The 12 individuals who were chosen by Christ had already made many amazing journeys with him. And the things that they had heard Jesus say and the things that they saw Jesus do reinforced their belief that he was indeed the promised Messiah of their Jewish tradition. The Jewish Messianic tradition was a journey that the apostles would have understood and even anticipated because it had a very clear and very certain destination. The Messiah would be revealed in Jerusalem. The temple would become the Messiah's throne and Israel would reign supreme over all the nations in kind of a spiritual period, I guess is how you might put it. Perhaps that is why Jesus' closest followers whether they panicked or not, decided simply that they weren't going to hear him. They're not going to hear what he says. When he gave a totally unexpected description of the journey to Jerusalem upon which they were about to embark. A journey unlike any other they had ever made. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. But they understood nothing about these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. That's how Luke ends that passage. When Luke says that what Jesus told the apostles was hidden from them using the passive voice of the Greek, it sounds like God intentionally kept Christ's followers from understanding it. But more than likely, at least I think, it was their own selfish expectations or sinful hearts that blocked their comprehension of the coming journey. Even if they understood that it was Jesus' plan that these terrible events take place, they had confidence in themselves that they could prevent those events from happening. They knew they could. They were prepared. In the coming weeks of this sermon series, we will see how, as they made stops along the way with Jesus, the apostles' belief in him as the Messiah is reinforced. But their religion and their own desires caused them, over and over again, to keep missing the point of the journey. How easy it is for us to miss the point when it comes to our spiritual relationship with God. Presbyterian author Anne Lamott, in her book, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, and I've used this quote before, it's one of my favorites, clear, clearly understands the Apostle's dilemma when she writes these words. I have a lot of faith, but I am also afraid a lot and have no real certainty about anything. I remembered something Father Tom had told me, that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. Certainty is missing the point entirely. Faith includes no 
noticing the mess, the emptiness and discomfort and letting it be there until some light returns. If there is a better description of the journey that the apostles were about to make with Jesus that begins in Galilee, I do not know it. That is a perfect description of what they were going to go through. The Holy Communion, which we celebrate this morning, must be a similar journey for us. No matter how we might want to approach the table, we miss the point of it entirely if we do not allow it to expose the mess in our lives and the mess in our hearts. If we are not discomforted by this table, then we've not heard what Jesus said. We've not shared it in the way that Jesus gave it to us. Communion is a journey of uncertainty for we who believe in Jesus Christ. When we come to the table asking God for forgiveness, we are penitent criminals throwing ourselves on the mercy of the court. Is that not what the penitent thief did? When from his own cross, he looked in humility at Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And do you remember how Jesus replied with absolute and unconditional love and a destination for all penitent hearts when he said, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me. Today. No matter what journeys the world requires of us, for those with faith, they begin in the same place and they end in the same place with Jesus. But they are not, they're never easy journeys. Whenever we allow Christ to lead our lives, we are on an uncertain path. That is the very essence of faith. Faith teaches us that the important part of any journey in our lives is not where we are going, but how we get to. The journeys we make in life like this journey, the cultures that are going on the coronavirus, they're going to test us and try us. Can we remain compassionate? Can we translate our fears into actions of love and service? Can we share when others hoard? Can we heal when others blame? Can we trust that Christ is with us and we are with Christ no matter what happens. Christ's answer at the end of his journey was, yes, we can. On the cross, his answer to us was, yes, we can. And the resurrection, his answer to us was, yes, we can. And at the ascension, when he told us to go out and make disciples of all nations, he gave us that answer, if we can trust that Christ is with us, yes, we can. Yes, we can. So this morning, may his answer be our answer, our faith, our life as we stand with him in Galilee this morning. And may our journey, not just for 40 days, but for all of our lives, may our journey be his journey. Now, and forever. Our hymn is number 2849 of the Word. It's by faith, looks up to thee. We will sing verses 1 and 3.
That's where I will be.